This episode's guest is also the sponsor of this episode. So thank you to today's sponsor, morelabs.io. Welcome to Coloring Crypto. This is your host, Gabe Colors. Back in the end of 2017, when, man, everybody and their uncle was just jumping into this crypto thing, and there was a lot of hype, a lot of promise, and there was just so many cool ideas of things that were going to happen and, and improve our lives, give us more personal power and control over our finances, our privacy, our data, all these things. A lot of these ideas are taking their time to get developed, get released, and impact our lives. We're calling this year, 2018, the crypto gestation period, which is fine. The people in the gestation period, I think the people that are working really hard on true solutions, take time. So that's what's happening. Not a lot. This is the gestation period. What's going to be the breakthrough blockchain technology delivering on all these promises? The promise of things like trustability and transparency and, you know, last episode 42 we had on Easy Tutor, Patents, episode 41, episode 38, Referral and Affiliate Programs, episode 35, Intimate and Engagements, Restaurant Guides and Ratings, episode 37 with 27V, Microfinancing, you know, 4 billion people will have no access to benefits of banking, Gewala, episode 31, tries to solve that, Gambling, Gaming, episode 24, Retail Coins, the uh, Reward Programs. We've been talking to so many of these companies doing ICOs or just any kind of token thing to bring a crypto solution to a current problem. Let's figure this out. Like, What's going to be the best problem or the most fitting problem that the blockchain can solve? It's the gestation period. So with all these examples... Come with us. Let's see. Follow me at Gabe Colors on Twitter. Yeah. Here we go. What I think is a really cool use case. Mortgages. Buying a house. The American dream. Which is so tied up in the history of cryptocurrency. As you know, the Satoshi white paper that sort of began Bitcoin, that was the seed of Bitcoin, happened right in concurrence with the 2008 financial crisis. You know, if you watch these documentaries on Netflix and just hear the story, it's really tied in with like the, the failure of trust in financial institutions and governments and these centralized, powerful entities that run and we just basically depend on entirely. That's all intertwined. Today, we've got more labs. More labs is bringing mortgages to the blockchains. MoreLabs.io, we've got the CEO. Hi, uh, this is Hanu Shin. I am the CEO of More Labs. And we've got the president. Yeah, and hi, this is Daniel Minotovich. The co-founders. Welcome, guys. We are uh, mortgage veterans in the mortgage technology space, and we are looking to develop a, a solution for what we view as a significant problem in, in the U.S. mortgage market. Okay, so mortgage technology, what's your background? Uh, having come from the better part of 20 years working in finance, lending, in the mortgage space, in and around the technology space, having operated a mortgage technology company for the past four years, uh, we're really excited about this opportunity. I am a news business partner and sidekick, and we're both tackling this tremendous problem in the U.S. mortgage market. And, you know, describe the problem you're solving right now. Yeah, uh, Gabe, the problem that we're we're addressing right now is is one that actually uh, really came as a result of the financial crisis. Uh, of 2008 and, and, and all the, the aftermath in the wake of that crisis really created a problem that we have today. We've got close to 20 million Americans today that can't buy a house, can't get a mortgage. Why? I mean, they were, they were the collateral damage as a result of the financial crisis. They, they lost jobs, uh, bankruptcies, foreclosures. Uh, they had to find new jobs, but ultimately we know that you know these 20 million Americans—they're not homeless. They're 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 gainfully employed. They got their balance back. They're you know they're largely a lot of them are working as contractors, 1099 guys and girls. 
Um, but the banks don't like that. They, you know, they, they look at those folks as odd lots and they don't really want to get involved in underwriting and giving them a mortgage to buy a home, even though they're perfectly capable of, of handling a mortgage. Just for example, this would be people who, who maybe they went bankrupt in 2008 or their credit just got really screwed up, but they're currently back to like they've got, you know, their cash flow is, is flowing now. That's right. But it's just their record is kind of tainted. That's right. I mean, I don't want to get too, too much into the weeds, but if you had a foreclosure or bankruptcy on your record and your FICO score isn't, isn't up to snuff, um, oftentimes, you know, that, that stays on your record for up to 10 years. So for regardless of the fact, they could be making a great living, a healthy living today, working as a contractor, working multiple 1099 jobs, perfectly capable of, of affording uh, a home. Uh, bankers and real estate agents, they just kind of ignore you. I mean, I, I'll tell you, one time, I travel quite a bit, and, and in some of these long rides, you end up, you know, as we all know, you, you, get, you start chatting it up with your Uber driver. And I came across a driver that, that prior to the crisis was a uh, CFO of one of the AT&T units, right? This guy was making a lot of money. He was doing extremely well, had a nice house. And when it came time to reef, but afterwards he lost his job and had plenty of savings and um, was now working as an Uber driver and some other, and some other things. And when it came time to refinance his home, the banks, given that he didn't have that W-2, would not give him a mortgage. So it, it's really, he had to sell his house and go rent. And um, that, that's, that's a problem that I think many Americans could share that same story. So that's a problem people can identify with. What are you guys doing at More Labs to help solve that? So what, what, what we've identified, and we've spoken to numerous parties along the, you know, along the, uh, the workflow chain of, of the mortgage industry, whether it's brokers, whether it's banks, whether it's uh, the hedge funds and aggregators that buy, ultimately purchase, and then securitize these mortgages. Um, all across the board, there's a real need to re start evaluating an individual's cash flow and their ability to repay a loan as opposed to looking back at FICO scores and blemishes on their credit record or looking at a 1099 that's not as Somehow they're not as credit worthy as a W-2 salaried worker, which is absolutely not the case. So we've spoken to a number of folks in the industry that we believe are probably some of the smarter folks in this space. And they really want to start focusing more on that ability to repay the loan as opposed to whatever happened in the past. We can develop that on the blockchain, which will grow this market dramatically. It, it'll help you know, 20, 25 million Americans who currently can't buy a home. And quite frankly, it'll, it'll reduce the overall costs of buying a home. Yeah. So we're really the, um, the technology platform that helps alleviate all the challenges that the, the antiquated banking infrastructure in the U S has to deal with entrepreneurs, consultants, they have difficulty obtaining mortgages because of their uneven, unsteady income stream. So the platform that we're developing is going to alleviate the credit worthiness aspect to make sure that they're able to get the loans that they need at the lowest possible price. Um, and I watched this video that Tom Lee put out about like the changing, the changing impact on the economy from various generations, right? Like where you get the boomers and like what happened with the stock market and, and housing based on, you know, their peak age of, you know, uh, the, the buying point in their life and like anticipation of uh, what happens with millennials hitting, hitting kind of like that peak buying age. Um, well, first of all, how did you guys get Tom Lee on, on, uh, on your, on your board? Well, uh, Tom, Tom and I, this is Hanu, uh, Tom and I have been friends for probably personal friends for 20 some odd years, um, dating back to our days in, in Philadelphia. Uh, where we both grew up. He, uh, he obviously went off uh, to the research side and we had kept in touch quite a bit. And when he was at Solomon and he was an institutional ranked uh, research analyst, then, then moved on to become the chief U.S. strategist for J.P. Morgan for several years before starting his own research firm and, and, and really tackling uh, the Bitcoin blockchain phenomena. Um, 
we've just been personal friends and we met recently, uh, you know, literally at a conference, uh, that we both planned to be at. And, um, you know, he suggested he'd love to be part of what we're doing, heard what we're, we're, we're trying to develop and really gives us some good guidance, uh, not just, um, uh, within the marketplace, but helping us sort of understand the different players, the different platforms, the different uh, technologies. So he's been quite a bit of a, a, a nice sage when it comes to that. I'm curious. So, so, so you guys, uh, you kind of came up with this idea on your own and then he found out, he's like, Oh man, you're working on this. I'm really into it. Or did you kind of like, were you, were you paying attention to his, his, um, his uh, models and forecasts and kind of um, basing it on that? Or was it more of a coincidence? It was it was a little bit of both. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, I follow you know some of his uh, interviews. He's quite informative and, and fairly, uh, you know, his, his explanations are, are tend to be some of the be- better ones in the industry in terms of why the you know, the Bitcoin market is going the way it's going. Crypto is doing this and that. Uh, seems to have a very very strong solid approach and, and obviously has is deeply connected you know with, within that network um we uh daniel and i owned and operated a mortgage uh, technology company that automated and provided compliance for uh, the u.s banking industry around mortgages so we had a deep deep knowledge of how technology is applied in this space what could be improved um and so really it's it's bringing those two together and, and sitting down with Tom, telling him how, how we want to approach the market and then uh, developing sort of this uh, more, more formal relationship uh, as a board member. So, so we're big believers, Gabe, in, in blockchain technology and applying all of the openness, transparency that that you know, new and future platform has to the lending industry here in the United States and abroad. So could you, could you tell us, you mentioned like, you know, being involved in technology and, and mortgages, like, could you tell us like when you guys first got involved, what was it? What was the, how did technology interface with mortgages and how has that already evolved? So today uh, I would say that, you know, t- there has been an evolution over the last 10 years regarding mortgages and technology. Uh, clearly today it's uh, put, largely 100% digitized, uh, but still leaves a tremendous amount of room for improvement. Uh, but that improvement really is, um, you know, can only be really better, best achieved on the blockchain foundation as opposed to a current sort of cloud-based uh, format, which everybody's operating under, because there's a, still a tremendous amount of wasted time, inefficiencies, and duplications. I mean, for example, you, you, Gabe, you want to go buy a house tomorrow. The first thing you're going to do is go to four or five banks to shop and get you know, the best mortgage you can. Well, all four or five of them are going to request the exact same documentation from you. They're going to want tax forms, uh, whatever the latest, they're going to order their latest appraisal. They're going to want all of your financial information, but you're going to have to give that to them scan it or mail it or copy it five times right with our technology you know it would it would all exist both you know in 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 a document format verified authenticated and secure it also have the metadata which is very important that uh, that future future evaluators of your loan could just simply run their own uh program with and having to do that once and having it verified once Really, you can imagine the amount of paperwork, time, and energy that you would save and cost uh, by having that developed on the blockchain. If, if we can simplify, you know, we're going to take several weeks, if not months, worth of time and effort and energy and putting together all of these mortgages, and then condense it down to minutes. But what's the what's the essential component you guys are looking at that would you know? Qualify me or not qualify me. But the primary, the primary goal of, of our, our system is to take a look at your cash flow capability over the over a period of time, not just a snapshot of your bank account, which is currently what they do today, but really understanding your you know money in money out. Can you afford this mortgage? That's really the driver, uh, and we have some proprietary technology that can do that. 
uh, literally within minutes. How are you kind of um, looking at fiat versus crypto, um, or like where, where do you guys fit in that in that uh, network? Well, today what we're trying to do is just solve the issue of primarily, um, you know, Americans not really qualifying or fitting within the box of your traditional mortgage to allow them the opportunity uh, to buy a home and have home ownership. Um, I think I think as as this evolves, you know, I think the question of fiat versus crypto can be worked into that equation. But today, I think the problem is more basic that, that we're trying to address. Um, and I think it'll be probably some time before crypto, you know, using crypto to purchase homes. I think that, that that's a bit that might be a little bit away. What do you guys think is the advantage of being a startup? Yeah, I was going to say, so, so one of the uh, advantages of being a um, smaller technology company is our, is our speed to market and our nimbleness and ability to pivot and utilize our expertise without a lot of bureaucracy that exists in, in existing entities. So I, I think that's a major, major advantage that we have above everybody else. The, the deep bench of expertise and then our technological prowess. What was your process when you when you kind of like saw that blockchain, blockchain technology coming out and you're like, wow, that would be a really, this would be a, you know, mortgage, mortgages would be a really good use case for this. What was your learning curve and what was it like and what, what, what have you learned? What would you give as advice to people who have a business idea that's, you know, in some ways similar, but maybe not even to your, your business idea to, to, figure out how do you, you know, do, you know, um, how do you bring it to the blockchain? You know, I, I would recommend to people that, you know, based on their existing profession, their past uh, expertise in, you know, be it in technology or be it in a consumer-based business, uh, whatever it is, you know, if, if, if we looked at the blockchain and does our technology port over, will blockchain make it better? And it sort of checked all the boxes for us. In, in what way? Like yeah. So for, from our perspective, look, in one's lifetime, purchasing a home is arguably the la single largest transaction that any American will enter into. And it's probably the most complex in documents, paperwork, information flow back and forth. So that, that in and of itself begs that, you know, authenticity, authentication, verification, uh, security, compliance, those are all the, the, the facets of blockchain that really make this transaction more efficient and better, particularly given how important it is. For example, you know, in the wake of the crisis, and I think people, this was, this was highlighted uh, after the financial crisis, people didn't realize that their mortgages within 30 days of closing would be repackaged and sold to somebody else. That person will repackage it, strip it, and repull it and sell it to somebody else. By the time a lot of these foreclosures came around, people didn't even know who owned their mortgage. It would have been traded and sold and bought and sold six times to some other organization. Even with that type of transaction, just the accounting alone within blockchain and the, and the validity of the documents and then the timestamping just just makes that process infinitely cleaner, easier, and more accountable. See if I get this right in that, you know, as I, I get a loan from my, I get a loan from my house, that bank that gives me the loan, then within 30 days, you know, might repackage that, sell it, and it keeps getting transferred around. So the paper trail begins to get difficult because they're using different accounting methods or you know, they've got, they've got, they do not have transparency in their bookkeeping. And so you'd go, trying to, trying to uh, go along that trail, you would uh, find these sort of gaps or holes because of the lack of sort of protocol. Um, and then on the blockchain, it's a single protocol. It's a transparent, you know, the, the public ledger um, that would be much more traceable. Exactly. That's exactly right. I mean, literally, documents were lost, uh, you know, signatures, you know, fell through the cracks. So there were all kinds of disasters that occurred, you know, and we found out that this, this goes on today. And I mean, a, a lot of the very hyped up, you know, Bitcoin lovers, blockchain lovers, 
really like to talk about um, the fact that, you know, the Satoshi white paper really came out right around the time of the 2008 crisis. And, and for some people, it's a revolutionary document. You know, it's, it's like we don't need right. these systems in these banks. Um, and you guys, you guys were involved in um, with financial institutions. Can you give us a couple stories or just like your, your picture of uh, you know, what was happening back then? Sure. Um, look, I, I, I spent, you know, Daniel and I both, we weren't involved directly in this process. I you know, spent some time in the financial industry uh, within some of the investment banks uh, and private equity firms back during that time. And, you know, it was a little bit uh, of a unique uh, a phenomena that occurred in the country. Right? So in the years leading up to the financial crisis, you know, we we had we had a situation in a system and an ecosystem that was effectively developed to um, obviously you know driven by greed uh, to make as much money as possible off the, uh, the housing market and as a result a lot of you know standards standards were gone they were lost I mean back in you know oh three oh four oh five I mean you had I mean they used to say if you could fog a mirror you can get a loan. Um, uh, there, I mean, there are stories back in, in the, that time where you had, you know, you had, you know, dancers in Vegas that were flipping four or five homes at any one point in time um, and getting mortgages for that. And the reason is, you know, the more mortgages they could generate, uh, the more the banks could then sell to the investment banks who would take that, repackage it and sell that off as what they call uh, CDOs and, you know, pools of mortgages and, and CMBS and, and all these other terminology. But basically it was taking all of these loans, saying they were good, packaging them up and pulling them into uh, a giant pool of, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and then selling bets on that pool, whether or not that, that, that mortgage will perform. And as a result, people got paid a lot of money along the way, especially the investment bankers. So they were incentivized to do this regardless of the quality of those loans. And as a result, you know, ultimately that all came crashing down as delinquencies spiked and people couldn't, you know, strippers couldn't afford f five homes in Vegas. And uh, interesting story as this was all happening, you know, I remember distinctly in the, Summer of 2006, I uh, I was talking to one of my good friends who was actually a uh, mortgage salesman who was literally in the middle of the underbelly of this sort of machine. And he said, Hanu, I'll tell you what, you know, uh, this whole thing is going to come crashing down pretty soon. This is a nightmare waiting to happen. And I distinctly remember that because as it did about a year or two later, um, you know, I just thought back to that conversation and, and said, wow, I mean, here's a guy who's in the middle of this entire machine and basically knew that the emperor had no clothes. And that was in 2006. You, like, at, at that time, do you remember, like, uh, did, it, did it shift your own perspective of what was going on? Oh, it definitely shifted my perspective. Yeah. It's not like I thought this guy was crazy. I saw the, the, the climb in real estate prices. I saw, um, I saw the growth of the mortgage market, the growth of the CDO market, which was a pure casino gambling bet. And I said to myself, how is this possible? How can the market be 50% higher than it was when I bought my home in 2001? And... You know, I, I don't know what's going on. This, is, this looks crazy, and he's probably right. There's no way this market can sustain itself. There's no way you can buy a house for 500000 and five years later it's worth a million, too. It's not possible. So uh, I, t I, I, I took a lot of comfort in what he said because it helped me understand that this is going to be over, and it's going to be really bad. Yeah, I had, I had a friend um, just get one of, the, you know, one of those loans where, like, the first year was going to be very, very manageable and, like, and they got totally screwed by the by the crash. Um, it was really hard to, to watch. Um, I mean, is it that could have been a better thing to do at that time, like to just declare bankruptcy or? Well, it really depended on your situ individual situation, your prospects at the time. Um, but you know, quite frankly, uh, you know, a lot of folks, a lot of folks just left. They just walked away in the middle of the night. 
right? They just left the keys, banks came, took it over. Um, they didn't even go through a process, uh, a foreclosure process or whatnot. Uh, a lot of folks did file bankruptcy to try and protect their homes and try and stay in those homes a little bit longer. So there was a, was a there was a lot of you know gnashing of teeth. Right. In theory, like so, ten years later, they they would have had their you know, ding, dings on their record. Yeah, but that that that, that happened. You know, that really that that wake of the financial crisis really stretched into you know. Uh, from 2008 all the way to kind of 2013. So there were a lot of victims that were still hanging on. You know, in some states, the foreclosure process could take years. Um, and ultimately, they threw in the towel. So those are on the record. You know, if you think about it, where we are today, you know, it's only been, you know, four or five years from when, you know, they had these major life, you know, events that will still stay on their, their credit report for the next four or five years. So yep, I, I, I could be back. Go ahead. Daniel, we're going to add something. I was going to throw a little quick story as an aside. I was in Mexico for a month um, working at a co working space, and there was like a guy in his late 60s who was just working harder than anybody there. And it's exactly what happened to him. He had had, he lost millions in 2008. And now he's living in Puerto Vallarta, you know, living a fine life, but just probably extended his retirement by, you know, half decade or a decade because of all that stuff. And people just, you know, people forget that there are, the lasting impacts are, are very real on individual levels. Um, so yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no doubt. There's a lot of uh, anger and resentment and just recognition of this issue. And these big banks are bigger. Um, and uh, so this idea of you know a, a, a mortgage solution on the blockchain, I think people will get the problem you're solving. Um, I'm curious to, to get more into like you know your own your own roadmap and timeline and um, what it's looking like to build up the team to to do this. Um, if you guys want to share any about the technology you are building this on, uh, what that looks like. Uh, Daniel, you there? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can jump in. So, so we're we're building this on the uh, Ethereum platform. Uh, so, um, you know, we're going to be utilizing a lot of the uh, technical components that that we've developed uh, over the last you know five six years and in other ventures and you know all, all the backgrounds we have and you know the goal is to create something that is open that is transparent and that is fast so uh, we help lower the cost ultimately of mortgages in the long term and so is it like literally going to be like a website I'd go to to apply for, or is it more like a backend technology that like different, um, you know, companies could use uh, to plug in through your tools? So, so we're, we're initially uh, going to be rolling things out from a corporate use perspective. Okay. So that way industry professionals could be using it. Uh, but I, you know, I can see over the longer term that we open it up more on the, on the consumer side, but but our expertise really lies on the uh, on the business to business side. Okay, so let's say let's say a young couple got married, you know, in their early thirties. They are just now thinking, okay, we want to buy a house in a couple of years. They're probably super focused on their credit rating, you know, and they probably should be. Uh, but let's say that they're thinking, that they're hoping that your model begins to you know get some traction, get some success you know, let's say in three, four, five years, like what should they really be focused on? Certainly, you know, manage your, your credit rating because today that's still, you know, largely the way that you're, you're judged. Um, but, but also I think it's behavior, right? Um, it's, uh, you know, obviously generate as much capital as you can get, get you know, you want to have the, as, as maximize your, your earning potential. But I think it's also spending behavior. And I think there is a shift a bit, terms of, um, you know, just because you're young, you just got married, you got, you know, you got two jobs and doing whatever you're doing, uh, establish a pattern of prudent spending. And, and that, that is something that, you know, for example, our investors, our, our clients are really now shifting their focus on because it's about, you know, excess cash flow. 
So if you're spending more than you're, you know, you're making, obviously that's a problem. Um, so I, I would say shift your behavior. You know, do you really need to buy that? <laughs> you know, we all splurge once in a while, but you you don't want to you don't want to have a pattern of splurging. I'm trying to think of how to, like. Uh... Is there more you guys can share? I'm definitely going to edit this part out. Is there more you guys can share about like the actual technology you're using? And it's, it's, what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing off the record is is like the, the there's uh like you that's sort of proprietary stuff that you don't really want to get into, or or you're still figuring it out. But um, is there specifics you can you can add besides just saying like you know your your experience and your technology to talk about what you guys are going to be creating? Well, I would start by saying it is it is pretty highly proprietary uh, in terms of what we're doing, because what we're doing, I believe, is really not being done in the marketplace, even though I know there are lots of participants who want this type of functionality. In addition to all of what, what blockchain provides, you know, sort of the way we approach uh, approaching this technology is is a bit revolutionary in the industry. And I don't think we could have come to that conclusion had we not spent so much time uh, with all the mortgage participants. Got it. Okay. Um, how about this? You know, it, with, with both of your backgrounds, um, you know, with mortgages and then with financial systems, with investment and just, you know, having a good sense of uh, how money moves, what's your take on, you know, in the last year for folks that are crypto investors out there, you know, so folks that made a lot of money on Bitcoin or Ethereum or picked some altcoins and got lucky. And then in the last nine months, the, the crypto markets have been going down. What, what, what's your own personal take on um, what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm no expert in the space, but, you know, from what I, what I can gather, um, there's a couple things that are going on that, are, that seems to be impacting the major cryptocurrencies and, you know, number one, you've got, you know, what we didn't have a year ago are futures. And we're seeing a lot of expirations coming up uh, in, in, in June, July, and that's weighing heavily on the marketplace, right? You've got a lot of people that are long crypto and, and have, uh, are short, you know, have short positions in futures. So that, that puts inherent pressure on the currency. And then you've got, um, Right now, you've got uh, some regulatory overhang that's always going to put a bit of a damper uh, as the SEC and the different agencies come out with anything. The fact that they're even saying something, I think, puts a damper on the market. And then I think you, thirdly, you, we have a tremendous rise in, in the ICO market, right? I mean, we've, I think the ICO market has... Uh, is today has has issued more ICO in dollar terms than all of 2017 together. So as you have an increasing amount of tokens, and you know you're going to have less demand on 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 just the pure cryptocurrency side. So that that's my general take. I'm no expert on it, but that's kind of where I see from a few feet away. Uh, you know, I, I would add to that that, uh, you know, obviously uh, this is a global phenomenon, right? So this is, you know, the cryptocurrency market is one that's going to stay around uh, for our lifetimes anyway, uh, as there's just mass adoption globally. So it's not just a U.S. centric type of, you know, new market development. So uh, it's going to continue to increase in size and importance. And as institutions and companies become much more comfortable with the technological platforms, they'll be able to offer solutions to, you know, uh, the everyday individuals. So that way they could use cryptocurrencies and purchase it on a much more frequent basis, right? Even today, if you're looking to spend BTC or, or, or Bitcoin Cash or, or some other crypto, uh, there's there's some difficulty uh, in in using it in an everyday context. So as the market matures, there's going to be a lot more activity and and a much greater pickup in, in the use to solve to solve everyday needs by the masses. I like you brought that global element up because I was going to ask um, how do you approach that from the more labs perspective? How do you uh, do you need to roll out? With different kind of um, execution strategies in different um, countries, or, or is there a sort of global 
uh, ubiquitous way you can do that? There is. So, so you know, our, our expertise uh, is going to, you know, first tackle uh, the market here in the U.S. because it's one that we know very well. But, you know, longer term, uh, you know, this is a global pressing need, right, for home ownership and how, how to provide the lowest cost possible to uh, to individuals. So, so that's a big problem and, and one that, you know, we would like to be a part of the solution in, in various geographies. How do people, um, if they want to find out more, how can people do that and what sort of level of involvement can they have uh, right now? You know, so I'd say uh, I, the website's a great source of information. So go to morelabs.io, uh, www.morlabs.io. Sign up for our newsletter, you know, provide us with your email address and let us keep you up to speed. Uh, Hanu and I travel quite a bit, quite extensively. Uh, you know, we speak at several different industry conferences in the U.S. Uh, feel free to come up to us and, and you know, we're, we're happy to speak with you and, and tell you more about what we're doing and, you know, the major problems we're trying to solve. So we'll put that in the show notes. For folks that want to find out more, go to morelabs.io. And then the last question I ask every every guest is, uh, you know, t with with all the all the noise in this in this space, how do you um, isolate you know signals that are that are clear that make sense, you know, and maybe? Yeah, I think the the, the real benefit of of having Tom Lee on our board and, and and getting his guidance is that we do he is able to cut out a tremendous amount of clutter uh, for us and sort of directs us to the right sounding boards that you know we should really be listening to uh, because there is a lot of noise in the space and it's obviously you know everyone has their own uh, self-promoting agenda you know these are these are these are very successful and proven uh, sort of uh, speakers for the space perfect Daniel any any, uh, any... so, so I, I I'd say more of an even higher level um, you know look to people that have been successful in the their own right, and that have, um, you know, done well financially, and are more entrepreneurial. So the Bill Gates, the Richard Branson's, the Mark Cuban's, the Elon Musk's, you know, these are people that have changed our, um, our world for the better, in my opinion. And so when you look at, you know, what they what they feel about the cryptocurrency industry and where you know technology is advancing. Uh, it's always nice to gain insight from people that are in the know and that are that are well connected in the business community. So th that gives me a lot of positive sentiment and and feeling that you know, um, as I alluded to earlier, you know this industry is only going to grow in importance, and uh, hopefully we'll be at the forefront of helping it change for the better. All right. Well, Daniel and Hanu of More Labs, uh, morelabs.io. Thank you so much for being on Coloring Crypto. Coloring Crypto. Thanks for having us.